everybody. My name is Mike Richter, uh, and I work at the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology. Uh, I'm also a Canyon, Gallatin Canyon resident. I live down at Karst. Uh, and I'm going to talk tonight about water supply and availability. Uh, okay, so on the first slide, uh, you may notice what we've got is a public water supply well hiding out in the tall grass here. And on the right, is one of our monitoring wells. That's here in the Meadow Village Aquifer. So we're gonna be talking about some of the data that's coming from that monitoring well in this talk. This well is instrumented with uh, sensors that take hourly water level readings. Big Sky runs on groundwater, point number one. We don't have any surface water reservoirs that we can pull water out of. We pump it all out of the ground here. That's how we get our water. So we're going to look a little bit at hydrogeology and aquifer types. The biggest takeaway point on the hydrogeology here is that our shallow sand and gravel aquifers that we've got are our best aquifers. Uh, by best, what I mean is we're getting our highest well yields and our best water quality from these shallow sand and gravel deposits. Uh, 60 feet deep is what we're looking at for maximum depth on these things. So they're quite shallow. Uh, these aquifers are connected to surface water uh, and they are vulnerable to contamination being that close to the surface. Uh, the Meadow Village Aquifer is where we're, we're going to look at that pretty in depth. Uh, there's an ongoing groundwater investigations program study and model. Groundwater investigations program is a Bureau of Relations Mines and Geology program that's look, really look, doing a detailed look at the Meadow Village Aquifer right now. So we're going to look at their depth contour map, uh, water level data from that monitoring well in the Meadow Village, recharge patterns, groundwater surface water relationships, pumping impacts of stream flow, <coughs> and the need for monitoring, modeling, conservation, and reuse. Or as I'm calling it, groundwater catch and release. <laughs> I always like to get out on a limb a little bit. So stay tuned for that. Uh, I also always like to get a picture of Ron Edwards up at some point. And I will not disappoint. Uh, okay, so here's an overview of the Big Sky area. Different colors representing different geology types. I'm not going to get into all that. The blue dots and triangles are where we, the Bureau of Mines and Geology, is monitoring groundwater in the area. There's 22 sites. All that data goes into the GWIC base. That stands for Montana's Groundwater Information Center. So you can find any of this stuff on our website. So if we zoom in a little bit further, these yellow, tan, buff colored blobs are the sand and gravel deposits. We're here right now at the blue star. So we're sitting on this Meadow Village Aquifer right now. This is where this GWIP study is underway. There's another sand and gravel aquifer uh, what we're calling the lower basin aquifer, just because it was labeled lower basin on USGS topographic maps, also known as the canyon. Basically, this deposit runs from the junction of Highway 191 and Route 64 uh, to the south down near Doe Creek. It's actually quite similar to the Meadow Village aquifer in that it's a shallow sand and gravel deposit sitting on top of shale units. Difference being, the stream that's connected to that aquifer is the Gallatin River. Whereas here, the stream that's connected to the aquifer is the West Fork. So let's zoom in even a little further. This is this depth contour map that the investigations program put together. So the first thing to notice here is that most of this deposit is only 10 to 20 feet thick. The usable part of this aquifer is shaded here where we have depths up to 60 feet. Sure enough, that's where the public water supply wells are that are supplying the water for the Meadow Village. So this is what I termed in a previous presentation as the meat bucket. Uh, that's some fly fishing terminology. The meat bucket in fly fishing is a deep spot in the stream where the big fish hang out. Uh, in the aquifer, it's where you get your good well yields. I did not call it the meat ocean. It's the meat bucket because overall this is a small area we're dealing with, but it's a highly productive aquifer. 
So if we look at some of our water level data from this aquifer, we got about 10 years of data here. Uh, this is from that monitoring well we were looking at in the opening slide. This is hourly data, so this, what we're looking at is depth to water level below ground. The vertical grid lines are January 1, so these are year intervals we're looking at. So the first thing you notice is that we got two bumps in every year. And those are the recharge events. So the first bump is snow melt. Second bump in each year is this fall recharge that we see pretty much every year. What that is is storm water. That's precipitation events recharging the aquifer. Uh, the other thing you can notice on here is that 2012 further kind of in this downward trend here. And so just kind of showing us that this system is, does respond to droughts. You get a dry phase and we, we did see declining water levels. Uh, if we zoom in a little further, just on the last two years of data, we can see where that public water supply well started to pump. That's these dropping water levels right here. So sure enough, when that well pumps, it, it impacts the water level in the monitoring well. And that's what that is. Uh, the other thing you can notice that right at the end, from this fall, you can see a three foot water level rise in this aquifer that started in mid-September from all those big storms that we got. So that is storm water recharging the groundwater system. So this is a great advertisement for strong storm water management in this area. Because as we develop big sky, and we king things, and uh, covering things in concrete and metal roofs, we potentially interfere with that system that lets precipitation recharge the aquifer. Okay, here's the West Fork now, flowing across this sand and gravel aquifer. As the West Fork enters the up gradient end of this aquifer, the western edge, it's losing water into the groundwater system. So water is leaving the stream channel into the aquifer. But as it continues to the east, it transitions. As the water, as you go east, the water table gets closer to the land surface, and the stream actually begins gaining water back from the aquifer. And stream, this is fairly common in these types of aquifers. Streams can change from losing to gaining as they flow through these kind of highly permeable aquifers. So to look at what I'm talking about in a cross section, a losing stream here at the top You've just got a water table that's at a lower elevation than the stream, and so the groundwater is flowing, or sorry, the surface water is flowing into the aquifer from the stream. Whereas in a gaining stream, the water table is higher than the stream, so the stream is gaining water from the aquifer. So to just continue that cross section of the gaining stream, but to add a few things, let's add a well to the situation. Okay? So we're We've got it's a gaining stream, water table is higher than the stream. We start pumping this well. We're going to pump it for 10 days and see what happens. <laughs> well, what happens is we start dropping the water level, but just locally. And this is kind of what we were seeing in that monitoring over there. Okay, what if we pump it for 100 days? Well, what happens is we drop the water table further to the point that we actually start reducing the discharge that's going from the aquifer into the stream. Now let's say we pump this well for a thousand days. We can potentially drop the water level to the point that now the groundwater flow direction has reversed and water is flowing from the stream to the aquifer. So this is why, why water conservation in Big Sky is probably what's going to carry us through uh, if we're going to make this all work. Because the water has got to come from somewhere. And at some rate of groundwater withdrawal, you start dewatering these streams. Well, I didn't mean to be a bummer, so let's... <laughs> so, what do we do now? Well, turn back to fly fishing. <laughs> Lee Wolf, catch and release pioneer, uttered the famous phrase, game fish are too valuable to only be caught once. 
And we are lucky enough to have with us tonight <laughs> two Montana water <laughs> reuse pioneers, Ron Edwards and Rich Chandler. But how does water, water reuse affect water supply? Well, quite simply, water reuse for irrigation and snowmaking is water that would otherwise be pumped out of the local aquifers or the surface water bodies connected to them. So treating reused water to the limits of technology, proper application rates, and extensive monitoring are going to ensure that water quality is not affected. Groundwater is too valuable to only be used once. That's all I got. Thanks.